couple of things. Uh, one of them is, uh, is our constructors. Okay, so we're going to talk about constructors. And then we're going to talk about what it means to create a new object. And what happens when you create a new object. And how is that different than when you create a primitive. These are all important concepts, believe it or not. Um, sometimes, you know, you can write code without necessarily knowing the nuts and bolts of what ha what's happening behind the scenes and what's happening in the computer's memory and so on. But I think, especially in Java and in other object-oriented languages, it's important that you really understand this because it has important practical implications. It matters the way that objects are created and it matters that there's a different way uh, that, that primitives are, are treated in a different way than objects and so on. So we're going we're gonna to explore that. First of all, let's look at the very first, uh, uh, not the very first example, but the first pizza example that we had. And let's look at the code. A constructor is the code that is used to create a new object. All right? Now, if we look at this pizza class, we don't see anything that is a constructor. All right? This is not a constructor. This is a method. This is not a constructor. It's a method. This is not a constructor, and so on. So for right now, take my word for it. But none of these are constructors. So this class has no constructor. And yet, we create an object. All right? Uh, therefore, how does it happen? If a constructor is needed to create an object, how are we creating objects? Any thoughts? The compiler makes a default. There's a default constructor that is created for you if you don't create a constructor of your own. And this is what is calling the constructor. Specifically, it is calling the default constructor. The constructor will simply be the name of the class. So pizza, there should be something inside the pizza class named pizza, something that looks like a function named pizza, if there was a constructor. But there is no constructor here. All right? Therefore, there's a compiler-created default constructor that accepts no arguments. Notice there's nothing between the parentheses. There are no arguments. So what this is saying is create the pizza object. What is an object? It's a member of a class. A class describes all the relevant information and methods that we want to have about a particular entity. An object is an individual instance of this. So the pizza class contains everything that we want to know about pizzas, all the characteristics, all the methods that we can do with a pizza. A pizza object would be one specific pizza that someone ordered and was going to get delivered or picked up or whatever. All right. So. This is when we call the constructor, when we see a line like this. Pizza equal, pizza p equals new pizza. And let's actually break this down, because this is actually two statements. And we could write it as two statements. We could write it like this. All right, so this statement here, that should be a lowercase p, by the way. This one statement that you see in the code that looks like this is really 
can be broken down into these two instructions. All right. This is different than when we, comp when we create a primitive. All right. When we create a primitive, we have an instruction that looks like this. In I, or maybe in I equals zero. These are both valid instructions. Let's compare what happens, and let's talk about what happens when we do each of these two pairs of things. First of all, we're going to talk about two kinds of memory. All right, the uh, what's called the, the stack memory and the heap memory. All right? The heap is just sort of what it implies. It's where all the objects live. All right? Where all the actual objects live in memory. All right? The stack is where the variables live. All right? So we have two sort of different things. We have the variables and we have uh, the values of those variables, the objects. So, a primitive is called a primitive because it's simple. If I have the instruction in i, i equals 10, all right, what happens is this. Nothing gets put on the heap. On the stack gets put a memory location that we associate the name i with. So certain bytes in memory, in the computer's main memory, in a section of the memory called the stack, get created. With an integer, it will get initialized to 0. And then if we have an assignment statement, i equals 10, what we do is we take that value and store it in this little location in memory. So i. A primitive variable i that's storing an integer is going to point to a position in memory where the integer value lives. All right? So this could be who knows what location in memory, some long number that says what bytes in memory that is. We don't really need to know the exact position in memory, but we know that we can call that position i. If I have another statement, j, int j equals i, that's also legal. It says create an integer, create a variable, integer called j. So when we create a variable, we specify what kind of variable it is, and we give it a name. So i is an int that's going to contain 10. If I say int j equals 10, or I'm sorry, int j equals i, we're going to create a variable in memory called j that can hold integers, and we're going to put the value of i in it. So when I'm done, I have two variables in memory. Both of them have the value of 10. All right? So if I have this instruction here, j equals 50, What happens? Well, it takes that 50 and it stores it in the memory location called j. Now, j is a primitive. It's not an array or anything, so it doesn't have a list of values. It has a single value. So j, if I say j equals 50, it gets rid of the value that was there and it stores a 50. So that memory location that corresponds to j that includes integers is now set to 50. All right? Does the value of i change? No. They're each their own memory locations. 
they store different values. So if I were to print I and print J, I'd get 10 for I and 50 for J. Right. It, it goes, yeah, it goes in sequence. So the first statement will create the memory location called I. Second one gives I a value of 10. The second one does two things. It creates a value, uh, creates a memory location named J that can hold integers. And then it sets the value of that memory location to the value of I. So at that point, J has a value of 10. Then the next statement occurs and we say j equals 50, it would wipe out whatever value we had in there. Now normally, of course, we're not going to have code this simple, right? Uh, so this is just for demonstration purposes. But if we had a function and we declared these variables and we had if statements and all that, that variable would get overrided every time we assign a value to it. Notice that this also doesn't create a new memory location. We create a memory location when we declare the variable. And also when we declare the variable, we say what kind of data can go into that variable. All right. So if I tried to do something like this, j equals hello, we're going to get a compiler error because you can't put a string in a place that's reserved for integers. All right. So that's how primitives would work. There's a handful of primitives. There's, there's ints, there's doubles, there's booleans, there's a char variable for a single character. There's, there's, I don't know, there's probably seven or eight of them. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm sure the book probably has a listing of them. Questions about that? That's pretty straightforward. Objects are a little more confusing. So let's create a stack a heap and some code. Part of this is going to be the same, part of this is going to be different. If I say pizza p and p equals new pizza Here's what's happening. The first line, and remember, we talked about combining these instructions into one. But I think it's important for us to understand each part of the instruction. So the first instruction, pizza p, says, similar to int i, right? Int i says, I'm going to create a memory location that can hold integers. All right? Here, I'm going to create a memory location in the stack named p that can hold pizzas, that can hold instances of the pizza class. In other words, pizza objects. That is a tiny misstatement. Actually, it can hold a reference to a pizza object. And I'll talk about what I mean by that in a minute. But we can consider it to simplify things. We can say it can hold a pizza object. Really, it's a reference to a pizza object. So does this pizza object correspond to any pizza right now? No. We've simply set up the space to store a reference or a pointer to a pizza object. We haven't actually created the pizza object. All right. That's different when we create an int. When we create an int, we create an integer, a place to hold integers, and we initialize it with a zero. So we have a value named, we have an integer called uh, int that probably has a value named z, uh, of zero. If we tried to do something with this pizza at this point, let's say before this line of code executes, if we tried to do something like print system dot out dot print ln p bake time or get the cost or something like that. 
we would get a very famous error in object-oriented programming, and that is a null object reference. What that means is you have a storage location set up to hold a pizza, but you don't, it doesn't point to a real pizza yet. All right? So what makes the real pizza and what sets that pointer to point to the real pizza? This statement here. And the key word is new. Whenever you see the word new, an object is being actually created. So this creates a pizza object. All right? What is the code that creates a pizza object? The constructor is the code that creates a pizza object. If you do not define a constructor, you get by default a default constructor that accepts no arguments and only creates a pizza object. That is, it only sets up the memory required to hold the pizza object. It doesn't do any sort of initialization. All right? When I say create the memory, where does it create it? Creates it on the heap. So here is a place to store everything about the pizza. So the pizza object gets put in the heap. Now, none of the properties are set, all right, because again, in this assumption, we're assuming we don't have a constructor, so we're using the compiler's default constructor. So none of the properties are set. We get essentially a blank pizza object in the heap. And p equals pizza says take the memory location where this is stored in the heap. That could be some number like 50680. But the memory location in the heap, take that and store it in the stack memory as a pointer to, to that object. So, in a primitive, the variable that is, the memory location associated with the variable contains the value itself. We can do that because primitive values themselves are simple. They're just numbers. Or they're booleans. So the memory location contains a actual value. And every time we create a variable, we are also creating a value that we're putting in there. And we can assign values to it. Objects are different, though. They're subtly different. If I say P, pizza P, I create a memory location called pizza that I can store pizza objects in. I can store pointers to pizza objects in. But the pizza object itself is not created until you see new pizza. All right? Now, here's where the difference comes in. If I say pizza Q, what does that do? Creates a pointer here that can hold pizzas. All right. What does it put in there? Doesn't put anything in there yet. We've just created a pointer. A pointer that points to nothing. AKA a null pointer. So a pointer that points to nothing. Right now it doesn't point to anything. If I were to say Q equals P, what do you think it does? Yeah, it copies not the object, it copies the pointer. All right? So it really does the same thing that primitives do, believe it or not. So, like if I just have this much code in here, and I say int i, i equals 10, int j equals i, it takes the value that's stored in that variable and puts it in here. In the case of a primitive, though, what you see is what you get. That value is the value of the integer. So it copies the value over. However, if I say q equals p, 
I do the same thing. I copy the value that's stored in the memory location Q to the value that to the to the memory location. I'm sorry, the 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 value of the memory location P I copy into the memory location called Q. So it'll have 5680. So both of these objects are or both of these variables, both of these pointers are pointing to the same object. Okay? Pointing to the same object. So if I say P set pepperoni true, then I print Q get pepperoni. What do I get for Q get pepperoni? I get true because P and Q are the same pizza object. They're pointing to the same pizza object. So if I do something using P, there aren't two pizzas here. There's two pointers to the pizza. You know, you could think of it as, as being, uh, you know, you have a, a student ID number, you also have a social security number, let's say. All right? Uh, there aren't two U's. There's one U, just your social security number points to you and your student ID number points to you. So if you were to change your name, then the name for both things, you know, should be changed. What creates an object new? So I could have an incredibly long series of statements that the answer is going to be very simple. If I say pizza P equals new pizza, pizza Q pizza R, pizza S, then I say Q equals R, S equals Q, no, Q equals P, S equals Q, R equals S, and so on down the line. How many pizza objects do I have? I have one pizza object. How do you know that? Count the number of news. All right? That's the highest value that you could have for objects. We haven't talked about when objects disappear, but we'll talk about that in a minute. All right? So, new is the command that will create a pizza object. It creates a pizza object by calling the constructor. In the simplest case, our first example, we had no constructor coded, therefore we use the default constructor that the compiler supplies. In this case, if I was going to draw it out, when I was done, I would have one pizza object on the heap, let's say it was in 476, and I would have four object reference variables that point to it. So there'd be four different ways that I could refer to that object. All right. So if I said S dot set pepperoni or P dot set pepperoni, I'd be changing pepperoni for the same pizza. Or if I asked for the price of P and the price for S, I'd be getting the price of the same pizza or the bake time or whatever. All right. And if you don't believe it, try it. Take that first example and add some new pizza variables to it. In fact, we might as well do it. We're here, right? I won't do four of them, but I'll just do one. 
So I'll say pizza P equals new pizza. Pizza Q, Q equals P, and I'll print the bake time for pizza P and the bake time for pizza Q. And guess what? They should be exactly the same because they both point to the same pizza. All right? It's just two different names for the same pizza. You know, we could say it's, the, it's Jones's pizza or it's the pizza that's going to 1005 Abbey Road, O'Leary, Ohio. Same pizza, just I pointed to it, I described it two different ways. So let's go and compile this. Interesting. Repeat that, please. Okay. There we go. Yeah, neither do I. Neither do I, apparently, no Windows 10. Yeah, probably. Okay, so let me go to the desktop, CD desktop, DIR, CD pizza one, DIR, that's where I want to be, clear screen, Java C, unit test, should only have to comp comp compile the one, right, because our two are linked. And then Java unit test bake time for one is 10, bake time for the other one is 10. Because right? it's the same pizza. All right? What makes it the same pizza? Because I say, hey, Q equals to P. And what that does is that copies a pointer that's inside P. So whatever object Q is pointing to, P is pointing to. On the other way around. Whatever object P is pointing to, Q is now pointing to. Now, remember I said something like the number of news would be the most number of objects that you've had. All right? Because objects go away. All right? This process is called a garbage collecting. All right? Java Virtual Machine looks for unused objects and frees up their memory. That's actually an important task to do, because otherwise uh, you have a bunch of stuff sitting in memory that's of no use to you, and it could actually slow down the processing and so on and so forth. When do you think an object goes away? When nothing points to it, exactly. When there's no references pointing to it. So let me write something up here. Let me write some code, and we'll look at the stack, and we'll look at the heap. Okay, this is a stack. This is a heap. And here's our code.
All right, let's analyze this. Okay, first statement. Pizza P equals new pizza. That's one of those combined statements. What does it do? It creates a variable on the stack called P that we're going to use to store pizzas. So we can only store references to pizzas in P. All right. If I tried to put an integer in there, if I tried to put a sandwich in there instead of a pizza, or something like that, it's going to give me an error. All right. So I have a variable P called P, uh, variable P that's going to contain pizzas. And then the second half of the statement says, and also create a new pizza in the heap. So maybe this is in 1985. We have a new pizza object that contains all the attributes and methods of a pizza. And then the pointer in P gets set to the location in memory that that pizza is at. All right? This next statement happens. Exact same thing happens. A variable called Q is created. It's going to hold a pizza. We create on the heap a pizza object. At this point in time, we have two pizzas because we have two news. And we haven't started playing around yet. So we have two pizza objects. P points to the first one, Q points to the second one. All right, so we can even draw a line. P points here, Q points here. All right, two new statements, two constructors get executed on the pizza. What does a constructor do? It creates in the heap a pizza object. And then, if necessary, it stores the results somewhere in the variable, P and Q. Now, the next statement says Q equals P. Well, what does that do? It takes the value of P and copies it into Q. So it gets rid of that, and it stores that. So now Q is no longer pointing to this pizza object. That link is gone. And Q points to this pizza object. Wish I had an eraser. Maybe I do in my bag. So what about that second pizza object? Who points to it? No one. No one points to this object. So, at this point, I realize this sounds like a little bit like a gangster movie, but that object is dead to us, right? No one's pointing to it. We can't write any code to access that object anymore. So even if it stayed around, it would just be a waste. Because no one points to it. No one remembers where that value is stored. All right. So therefore, we have an object that's sitting out on the heap without any pointers. So it's useless to us. We can't, the instance that this command executes, we can't do anything with this object that was created. No one points to it, so it's gone. What Java, what Java garbage collection does is periodically it will go through and look for these objects that have no pointers to them. And it frees up that memory space so it can be used for other stuff. If it didn't do that, then eventually this heap would start getting more and more and more and more filled and your program would take more and more memory to execute. It would take up more computer resources. It would slow everything down and it would just be bad news. So you don't have to do anything 
to kill an object. Just don't point to it anymore. Which means that if I have a function that creates a pizza object does a whole bunch of stuff and then ends that pointer lives only as long as this function's running so that function is done boom that variable's gone and therefore what then that if i haven't stored the pointer to that pizza object anywhere else that pizza object is gone and it's dead to us all right so it will get garbage collected at some point all right so that's what a constructor does. To review, it will create the object in the heap, and it will get a pointer to it and store that pointer wherever we tell it to store the pointer. All right? Now, if we don't write a, our own constructor, we get the default constructor that does that and does only that. All right. That's all it does. It doesn't set any variables, doesn't set any properties, doesn't do anything other than the memory handling. Creating the memory, storing that in memory, taking the pointer and storing it wherever we tell it to, sp to store it. We can, however, write our own constructors. And I'll show you the syntax to write our own constructors in a minute here. Here's what happens, though, when you write your own constructor. When you write your own constructor, that default constructor goes away. All right? Java effectively says, hey, this person wrote their own constructor. They're going to manage their constructors. I'm not going to do anything. So like, you don't get your constructor plus the default constructor. You get the default constructor because the compiler's smart enough to know, gee, you need one constructor at least. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to make objects of this type. So if you don't declare a, a constructor, it will make one for you. If you do co uh, create any constructor, any constructor at all, all right, you can, uh, you can do that, uh, and you don't get the default constructor anymore. So let's go into the second example. I'm going to get rid of this temporarily. I create a, a constructor. What's the difference right off the bat that you see between a constructor and a regular function? This is my constructor. This over here is a regular function. What are the differences between that? Because a constructor isn't really a function. It's like a function, but it's not really a function. Pardon me? There is multiple arguments, but you can write a regular function with multiple arguments, too. So yeah, that is a difference in this case. But in other cases, we'll have functions that have multiple uh, arguments. What's right. There's, first of all, there's no return value. It doesn't say public void or public int or public boolean or anything like that. It just says public pizza. And secondly, this name is not a function name. It's simply the name of the class. So the constructor, you can tell right off the bat if something's a constructor if its name is the same name as the class name. And it also won't have a return value. So what, what is this saying? This is saying I have a single constructor here. So that means I do not get the default constructor anymore. Because it is like, hey, this guy knows what they're doing. 
They wrote their own constructor. They must not need the default constructor. This constructor, though, however, create, uh, it uses three arguments. The size, the crust, both of those are strings, and the third saying um, whether it has pepperoni or not. Now notice what we do in the constructor. In the constructor, we set the size to equal to the, the argument for size, the crust to equal to the argument for crust, and the has pepperoni to match, to, to, to be set to the value of the argument for pepperoni. This constructor will do two things then. All right? This constructor will I'll wait on this. We'll hold that thought. Let's look at how we use that constructor in our code. So this is defining the constructor. Let's see how we use that in our code. I'm going to comment out these lines for a minute about our second pizza. So I'm just going to create Oops, one pizza. And give me the cost and the bake time for that pizza. So notice this. This line says pizza P equals new pizza L thin and false. OK, so what's this constructor going to do? Well, it does the same thing that the regular constructor, the default constructor did, right? It's going to create memory for this object. It's going to save the pointer to that object in a variable called p. But it's also going to pass to the constructor those three parameters. And what happens to those three parameters? Well, whatever we program it to do. In this case, we take the first parameter and set the pizza size to the first parameter. Set the crust to the second parameter. Set whether it has pepperoni or not as the third parameter. So when we call this constructor, because we have code for it, the constructor does a little bit more. So I have pizza P equals new pizza. L thin false. So pizza P, I create a memory location called P that can hold pizzas. I say equals new pizza. The constructor, first thing it does, it sets aside the memory for this pizza object. You know, maybe 5610 memory location. It does one more thing. It sets the properties of that pizza object to whatever the arguments are. Why? Because that's the way I wrote it. It doesn't magically take those arguments and put them in here. That's how I wrote that function, to take the first argument and put it in the size, take the second argument and put it in the cross, take the third argument and put it in the pepperoni. So it sets that to L, sets this to thin, and sets that to false. All right. So when we write our own constructors and we give them arguments, we can use those arguments to set certain properties. All right? We can set certain properties. Why do we create constructors like this? Well, it doesn't make sense to have a pizza that we don't know, you know, there's a pizza sitting over there. What size is it? I don't know. It doesn't have a size. Well, what kind of crust does it have? Well, I don't know. It doesn't have any kind of crust. 
does it have pepperoni or not? Well, I don't know if it has pepperoni or not, right? It's not a real pizza. If you're talking about a pizza, you got to know, at least in our world, you got to know these three things. Or the size of the crust, you know, what kind of crust it has, what's the size, does it have pepperoni or not, all right? Those are identifying characteristics. It would be like having a student without a student number, right? I want to create a new student in our system. Uh, or I want to refer to a student. I want to create a student object. Well, what's the student number? They don't have a student number. What? Students have to have a student number. What's their name? I don't know. What? Students have to have a name. So when you have a situation where you have a class that has attributes that it doesn't make any sense for them not to have values, then you can set up a constructor so that when you create it, you have to supply those arguments. All right? And sure enough, if we did the math, it did the calculation, and it showed the bake time and, and that correctly. All right? So that's when we create a constructor. We can create a constructor and give it some arguments that it can use to set certain properties. Now, in this case, I have a function that has three arguments. I could create defaults and write other constructors. Like, maybe the default for crust is thin crust. All right? Maybe that was my pizza place. Yeah, we sell deep dish pizzas, but, you know, 80% of the people uh, create a... Um, uh, you use thin crust. Now, if someone calls up and says they want a pizza and they don't specify the crust, we're going to assume it's thin crust. All right? We could write a constructor that looked like that to say, give me two arguments. And we can set the size. We're not going to have an argument for the crust. But well, we're going to have an argument for pepperoni, and the crust we're going to assume is thin. Because that's the default for our pizza shop. You know, we, you know, whether that's a good idea or not, you know, is, is, you know, we could, we could debate. But now what we can do is we can call this and create this and give it only two arguments. So let's go. I'm in the wrong place. Sometimes I do this when I'm grading, by the way. Star.java. That's a nice little trick that will compile all your Java code. And then I can say Java unit test. And it did the calculation, and if we went back and double-checked, it did the calculation as though it is a thin crust, all right? Because we assume that in the constructor. Now, the last thing I want to talk about today is this guy down here. What's going to happen if I try to compile this? A constructor, calling a constructor that has no arguments on the pizza. No arguments. It's going to give me an error. Why? Because I've supplied a constructor. Because I've supplied a constructor, um, there is no constructor created by default by the, um, by the compiler. It'll tell me that. No suitable constructor found for pizza, no argument. Tells us that very vehemently, in fact. Now, how could I make a constructor that had no arguments? What would I do? Well, I could make it with no arguments, easy, but then what I probably would have to do is hmm, 
maybe default all three of them, you know? Now, that might not make sense for pizza, right? I mean, it was a little bit of a stretch saying that the default was thin crust, all right? But uh, definitely, a, there's not really a default for whether someone wants pepperoni or not, uh, or whether, what size that they want. But I could, from a coding perspective, I could simply default those three parameters to what I thought were appropriate defaults, and then it would compile because I've supplied the no argument constructor. It's common to give multiple constructors because sometimes you know things, sometimes you don't. All right? When you create an object. And you, when you're creating this object, remember, you're creating a component that other people will use. By creating multiple constructors, you're simply making that uh, more, um, what do I want to say, more uh, flexible for people that are using your component. That they can create it this way or they can create it that way. All right, are there any questions? Okay, we'll see you up in lab.